back to the series dedicated to Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Riosto. Sorry if it took a little time between the last video and this one to be published, by, uh, but I haven't forgotten about this series. In fact, I'm still enjoying it very much. This poem is long and some cantos, like the one that we are going to read together today, Canto 20, are really long. Canto 20, in fact, has 144 stanzas or octaves, these uh, little octaves of uh, pure fun, pure electricity and energy that Ludovico Ariosto puts together in this rich tapestry. He's almost like a miniaturist because the details are so fine that it's impossible to remember everything and you almost enter the whirlwind of Ariosto's work and, and his mind and you just let yourself be transported by the fun, by the lightheartedness, and sometimes by some touches of genius. Okay, so let's get into Canto 20. I got here my Italian version of Orlando Furioso and my Barbara Reynolds edition, uh, translation, which is really good, and I've I kept following so far. So Canto 20 is not only long, but it's a novel in itself. It's a whole novel, it's a whole world. So I'm gonna try and make a really quick summary of the main portions and, as usual, read out in Italian the original uh, octave to show you the sound of it as best as I can and also show you a couple of gorgeous Gustave Doré illustrations specifically about this canto. Le donne antique hanno mirabili cose fatto nell'arme e nelle sacre muse e di loro opere belle e gloriose, gran lume in tutto il mondo si diffuse. Arpa, Alice e Camilla son famose, perché in battaglia erano esperte e tuse. Safo e Corinna, perché fundotte, splendono e lustri, e mai non veggono notte. The first three stanzas are used by Ariosto to praise the value, the valor of women in history. He also says that uh, women are, have been much more valorous and virtuous in history, than what writers in general have been prone to express and to describe in their, in their works. At the end of the second stanza, in fact, he says, l'invidia o il non saper degli scrittori. This is the reason why so many valorous women uh, were forgotten about, because of envy or ignorance on the part of writers. Now we go back to this island of the women, where Marfisa, has been fighting with a mysterious knight who has been very, very valorous and very strong to follow this tradition of the island. And so in between stanzas number four and eight, this knight reveals his name and origin, his identity. His name is in fact uh, Guidon Selvaggio, Guidone. Guidone is a very young, very strong knight We've never heard him before in Orlando Furioso. And in fact, when we get here and when he reveals his identity, any reader, including myself, when I got here, can be probably for, forgiven um, for thinking, well, okay, now he's going to be one of the hundreds of characters that Ariosto has already been talking about until uh, canto number 20. But no, he actually introduces a completely new character to us and he will keep doing this. In fact, they are not completely too new to the tradition because Guidone had already appeared in previous books and uh, previous stories. So this, we should think about uh, Orlando Furioso really a little bit like the Marvel superheroes because everybody knows who the superheroes are, but different authors and different writers uh, take these characters and uh, insert them in their own story, with their own style, with their own type of uh, story and always as long as they keep somewhat faithful to some basic uh, background. In fact, that's what Ariosto does with Guidone as well, more or less here. Now, since Guidone is a local on this island, he is questioned about the city's very strange customs, this custom of uh, fighting, making a test to whoever gets to the island. They need to beat at least 10 knights in battle and then they will need to satisfy at least 10 women. Where is this weird practice or tradition coming from? Guidone starts uh, speaking in stanza number nine, and uh, this will be a very long 
background story or origin story of this island that is also very interesting but is yet another parenthesis opened in the typical Entrelas Mount style of Ariosto. Long story short, the Greeks come back from Troy and they find that their women have, like uh, Ariosto says at the end of stanza number 10, the women tutte savean giovani amanti eletti per non si raffreddar sole nei letti always with a little point of or touch of irony. They've all found uh, some kind of younger man to be with. And with this man, they also had children. So the men that came, that come back from Troy and take back their place, they don't want to accept to pay for all these children. So some of them are just sent away. One of them is called Phalantos. Phalantos with a bunch of uh, really valorous, very young and handsome men ends up in Crete. In Crete, all these uh, men and phalantos make the Cretese women fall in love with them, to the point that when they leave, these women want to live with them. So phalantos, his men, and the women escape from Crete together and end up in a place in Syria, where they have a lot of parties, a lot of sex, a lot of fun, up, up to the point where, when the men get somewhat bored. In fact, in stanza 20, Ariosto says, Ma come spesso avviene che l'abbondanza seco in cor giovenil fastidio mena? Tutti d'accordo fur di restar senza femmine e liberarsi di tal pena, che non è somma da portar si grave come aver donna quando a noia sabe. Always tongue in cheek, constantly, constantly tongue in cheek, Ariosto. <laughs> it is what it is. The men abandon the women in Syria. They go on, in fact, Phalantos, based on the legend, goes on to found the colony of Taranto in Puglia, in Italy. The women are left by themselves in Syria. So between stanza 22 and 27, the one who becomes their natural queen, Orontea, proposes that they remain in Syria and they take revenge. First of all, they change the law to ensure a progeny, and they decide that each woman might retain only one male child out of their children. And here I want to show you the first masterwork by Gustave Doré, uh, specifically drawn for this canto, number 20, where Gustave Doré shows uh, all the women who had just arrived in Syria, in this island, in this city, looking out towards the sea in a position that is uh, maybe very sensual on one hand, but also very menacing because they are plotting their revenge. After many years, in this particular city of women that we can call, arrives a man called El Banio. And Orontea, she is still alive, but her daughter Alexandria, she falls in love, she really likes El Banio. El Banio is a very, very strong knight, and he, in talking with Alexandria, he tells her that he doesn't want to die as a prisoner like many other men have done before in the city. He would like to have the honor of be, being defeated in combat, at least in a battle. And so Alexandria hears his plea and goes to her mother, Orontea, to ask her the permission to do something for him. In fact, the council consents to Orontea's request, that was her daughter's request, and so Elbanio does his trials and he succeeds. In fact, his success is described in stanzas number 56 and 57, where Ariosto says, Contra dieci guerrier solo si mise, e l'uno appresso all'altro in piazza uccise. This is the end of stanza 56. He's won against ten knights, ten warriors. And then the beginning of 57, fu la notte seguente a prova messo, contra dieci donzelle in nudo e solo, him, completely alone and naked, with ten women. Dovebbe allardir suo si buon successo, che fece il saggio di tutto lo stuolo, e questo gli acquistò tal grazia appresso ad Orontea che lebbe per figliuolo. Orontea loved him so much because of his success that she decided to adopt him as her own son. E gli diede Alessandra e l'altre nove con che aveva fatto le notturne prove. Uh, this sounds very funny in Italian. Le notturne prove are the nightly, meaning in the night, prove or tests. He has made the test of the night together with these ten women. With stanza 64, Guidon ends his tale. He's been telling his tale, which was pretty long. And at this point, uh, Astolfo declares himself a kin to Guidon. 
In fact, they were cousins. And let's not forget that Astolfo is a very crucial character in the entire Orlando Furioso. So Marfisa calls on Guidone to join forces, to unite their strength, and uh, he, Guidone, ensures their means of escape. The companions fight their way to the gate, and here is where we can find the second masterpiece that Gustave Doré decided to draw on this canto. I'm going to show you how dynamic and just look at the beauty, the three-dimensionality of these bodies. Look at the detail. So our heroes prepare for battle. The battle is going to be the day after. And they united their forces. One stanza that I particularly love is stanza number 82, because in the classical style, Ariosto is starting by depicting and describing the, the weather, the sky, the light of dawn approaching, and he says, dal duro volto della terra il sole non tollea ancora il velo oscuro e tatro appena avea la licaonia prole per li solchi del ciel volto raratro quando il femineo stuol che veder vuole il fin della battaglia empì il teatro come ape del suo claustro empì la soglia che mutar regno al nuovo tempo voglia this stanza is really pregnant with the upcoming battle the fight finally starts towards the gate and everything is a mess because the women are so many they keep throwing arrows at our heroes until the moment in which Astolfo decides to blow in his horn, in his magic horn. This is a horn that creates a particular panic in anybody who would listen to it, who would hear it. This is explained in the second part of stanza 87. Astolfo tra sé disse, ora, caspetto, che mai mi possa il corno più valere. Corno means horn. Io vo veder, poi che non giova spada, si io so col corno assicurar la strada. Thanks to the magic horn, everybody gets into this panic and our heroes are able to set sail, every, all of them except for Astolfo, who remains behind. They arrive in Marseille, in France, where Marfisa abandons them, she prefers to go her own way, like the proper warrior that she is, this female warrior. Pretty soon, in her wanderings, Marfisa comes across an old woman dressed in black. This old woman, if we can remember, I didn't actually, we have already found in Canto 13. She is the old woman that Orlando met in this cave where he killed all these uh, criminals and the kidnappers. And so she's the same old woman. They meet, and shortly after, Marfisa also meet with, meets with Pinabel, who is another bad guy of the Orlando Furioso. Marfisa decides to fight with Pinabel for a, a very <laughs> inconsequential verbal exchange, and she defeats him because she's so strong. <laughs> then, along the way, they encounter Zerbino, the famous Zerbino, that we've seen only a couple of cantos ago, and he insults the old lady. At this point, Zerbino makes a deal with Marfisa. In stanza 125, Zerbino says, Che si io sono, vinto da te, m'abbia restar costei. If you beat me, I want this old lady to remain with me. Ma si io te vinco, a forza te la dono. Dunque provian chi de star senza lei. So, if I win, Zerbino says to Marfisa, you will keep this old lady. Otherwise, she stays with me indefinitely. Very quickly, Marfisa disposes of Zerbino as well. She defeats him. And Zerbino, in shame, has to go around for the rest of his life, it seems like, together with this uh, old lady and do what she wants. We know that Zerbino was in love with Isabella. And Isabella is believed by Zerbino to be dead out in sea. But we know that she's been saved. By whom? By the great hero, Orlando. Orlando has saved Isabella. Now, this old lady, she knows about that. And initially she says, I'm not going to tell Zerbino anything. But then she taunts him. And she says in stanza number 140, at the end of stanza 140, she says to him, Non è Isabella come credi morta. Isabella is not dead, like you think. Ma viva sì! Camorti invidia porta. She is so alive that Amorti invidia porta. She brings envy to the dead. Of course, Zerbino would love to know where Isabella has been seen, where the old lady saw Isabella, but the old lady is not telling him. And Zerbino first tries with the soft manners 
and then he tries with violent manners, but the old lady is not telling him anything about her. And this is the bitter end of this really long, really intricate canto number 20 of Orlando Furioso. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening very much. And on we go to canto number 21 the next time. Bye. Thank you.